how is it okay mm -hmm. that a man that just doesn't know who Jesus is and doesn't recognize him, but goes on and does good deeds, helps the orphans, helps uh, churches, uh, does whatever he wants, but he doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge that Christ is our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. He's sent to the same place that Hitler's going, that a rapist is going, that all these other people. Mm -hmm. terrible humans right. but and it's and hell is endless right it's gnashing of the teeth forever is that right is hell forever have you ever wondered about the nature of hell is it real who ends up there where is it located and how does it function if these questions intrigue you you'll find this video captivating today we'll discuss the metaphysical theories on this subject but first let's watch this discussion from george janko's podcast where he discusses with Cliff about the nature of hell and whether a loving God would actually send his precious creation to such a place. Afterward, I'll share more details on how hell works, which isn't sufficiently covered in the following discussion. Let's dive in. I don't know. Okay, well... Yes, it's forever, but the question is, is it gnashing of teeth forever? Yeah, in my mind, my and this is me just being... I, I pray that... I, I pray that whoever goes to hell gets burnt up and then no longer exists annihilation but yes. my brain is how could you eliminate something that's permanent right god is permanent so you can't eliminate permanent stuff so if we're made in his image maybe we are suffering forever and always maybe. after this is the most terrifying thing in the world to think about yep but how could a man that just all he did was not glorify christ but he gets put in the same oven that a man who molested children, that kidnapped people, right. how is that How you is bet. that merciful? You bet. All right, first point is be very careful about people who give you a photograph of hell. The Bible does not give us a photograph of hell. It's not a burning place? Well, Jesus talks about it as fire. Yeah. But know. it also talks about outer darkness. So how do you have fire and outer darkness at the same time? I think he's speaking metaphorically. Oh, Cliff, that's, you're just quibbling. Oh, you're just, you're just getting out of a difficult place. Wait a second. Jesus uses metaphor all the time. It's symbolic language to make a point, to speak truth. I am the light of the world. No, Jesus is not claiming to be a hundred watt light bulb. I am the door. No, he's not claiming to be two pieces of plywood slapped together. He continuously uses metaphor to point to truth, but it's truth that is not quite as physical as I would like it to be. And I think that's part of what hell will be. Hell is separation from God. I've chose to live my life separate from him. And he says, fine, Cliff, you chose to live your life separate from me. You'll spend eternity separate from me. So just floating out in the universe, how they always say the universe is really big. Are they just floating in darkness? Or, or as you pointed out, they might be annihilated. Uh, is uh, annihilated mean gone? Gone. That's, destroyed. That's merciful, though. Destroyed. That, that, like, even though, okay, for example, I'd never want to raise my hand and, and be, hey, man, that guy molested some kids. Yep. He needs to burn in hell for the rest of his life. Right. A lot of people are not wise enough to understand that he probably molested somebody because he was molested. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of demons on him. Yep. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, judge him. Right. But I know that if I was God, blasphemy of his sounds, I, I, you could point out any evil man in the world. I don't know if I could torture him endlessly right. forever right. and ever right. and ever. I, if I know my God's more merciful than me, that's a hard pill to swallow. Correct. Um, but my question is, how is it, regardless if it's t endless time away from him, or gnashing of the teeth in a fire forever and always. Mm -hmm. How is a man uh, first submit to a God that knows that Sarah, who's ho helping homeless people right now, dedicating her life, giving half of her money away, is in the same spot that Hitler and Genghis Khan is going? To me, it's hard for me to explain that to somebody. Right. And that's why I would not say same spot. Because I don't think hell is a spot. It's separation from God, but it's not a physical location necessarily. See, the Bible's sufficiently vague about it that I really don't know. In order to discuss hell, we must first lay a foundation regarding certain laws and principles. First, we need to explore the law of mirroring, also known as the law of attraction. This law is far more profound than many realize because everything within us is reflected in our lives. People often believe that by focusing on wealth and repeating affirmations like, I'm rich or I attract money, they'll manifest abundance. This involves the conscious mind, which only comprises about 5% of our overall being. The subconscious mind, which shapes 95% of who we are, also mirrors our reality. Think about it. If your subconscious has been programmed with beliefs from your parents, such as money is evil or only bad people are wealthy, 
then most of your being sees money as something negative. Consequently, you can't manifest wealth because the majority of your subconscious mind opposes it. When we use mantras and visualize luxury to manifest desires, we're only engaging a small fraction of our consciousness. This is why manifestation can be so challenging. It's not as straightforward as it seems. In our physical world, instant manifestation doesn't exist. Imagine thinking of a car and having it appear before you like magic. That's instant manifestation. The reason we manifest aspects of our lives rooted in our subconscious is that these deep-seated programs have been with us for a long time, often since childhood. Therefore, they shape our reality over time. Even in a state of deep depression, you're not surrounded by literal monsters or bombs reflecting your inner turmoil. This indicates a time buffer in manifestation, preventing immediate consequences of our thoughts, which is crucial for our survival. However, after death, we're no longer bound by the physical world's density, and manifestation becomes instant. What does this mean for the afterlife? It implies that your state of consciousness or vibration at death continues into the afterlife. By vibration, I refer not to fleeting emotions, but to your baseline consciousness. We all experience fluctuations, but we have a standard level of consciousness to which we return. Most people exist in a state of pride consciousness, while others may dwell in anger consciousness, characterized by constant violence and abuse. Such individuals suffer immensely in life, living in a self-created hell. If such a person dies, they might find themselves in a hellish afterlife. Not because God condemned them, but because we are responsible for our own experiences. The anger and hurt within them create their outward reality, filled with violence and threats. In the physical world, the time buffer means angry thoughts don't instantly manifest danger. In the non-physical realm, this buffer disappears, and their internal state immediately shapes their surroundings. Imagine this person dies and suddenly finds themselves in a terrifying place, full of fear and threats. They think they are in hell. But this isn't a location for condemned souls. It's a manifestation of their own vibration from life. They project this hell around them, joined by others of the same frequency. Continuing in this hellish state, they relive their negative thought patterns, perpetually creating their suffering. They trap themselves in a loop of fear and hostility, unaware they can escape at any moment. This endless cycle continues until they are utterly exhausted. At some point, a positive memory might surface. A childhood moment in a garden with their grandmother, surrounded by flowers. This shift in thought brings a change in energy. Instantly, beautiful flowers manifest in their hellish surroundings, showing how a brief change in vibration can alter their reality. However, the powerful loop of suffering soon overpowers this moment, and the hellish environment returns. The key to escaping this hell is a change in vibration. Trapped in fear consciousness, they see everyone as an enemy and can't conceive of help. But as their suffering intensifies, they might finally think to ask for help. This higher vibration thought can instantly manifest the assistance they need, possibly from angels or high vibrational beings. Proof of this is seen in the harrowing near-death experience of Howard Storm. Initially an atheist, Storm lived a life filled with anger and hate for people, harboring a negative, prideful consciousness that ultimately shaped his afterlife experience. Upon his death, he found himself in a self-created hell, tormented by demonic beings that mirrored his inner turmoil and despair. It was only when he managed to shift his vibration through prayer and recalling fragments of his childhood faith that he was rescued by a being of light which he identified as Jesus. This higher vibrational thought brought about a profound change in his environment, transforming his hellish reality into one filled with love and light. Storm's experience exemplifies how altering one's state of consciousness can dramatically change one's reality even in the afterlife, aligning perfectly with the idea that our internal vibrations manifest our external circumstances. These beings of light might have always been present, but remained unseen due to the person's low vibration. 
By asking for help, their vibration shifts, revealing the help that was always there. This change frees them from their suffering. It's important to realize that the person in hell is powerful enough to save themselves. They must make the shift, and when they do, they discover a new reality before them. When I say save themselves, I don't mean that they atone for their sins. No, I mean they have the power to decide to metanoia, which means to repent or change their thinking. And that thought is to look up to the Creator and Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ, who is mighty to save. Here's what the Bible says about God always being with us. In the book of Psalms, chapter 139, verse 7, If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. You can't escape God's love. The Apostle Paul put it this way, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the bottom line. All who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved.